All right, and welcome back to FYI, the For Your Institution podcast presented by Mongoose. I am your host, Gil Rogers, and I am excited today to be joined by founder and CEO of the sponsor of this podcast, Mongoose, Dave Marshall. Dave, welcome back to the pod. Uh, Gil, I got to tell you, uh, I'm so happy to be here, and I'm excited for the conversation that we uh, will have today. Awesome. Yeah. Thank, thank you so much for taking the time to, to join us again. For those who are not familiar, um, shortly after I stepped into the host chair last year for FYI, uh, we had a pod, we had an episode called uh, AI in Academia, um, and that kind of blew up. It's, it's still to this day our um, number one most downloaded episode of FYI since I stepped into the chair anyway, um, or sat into the chair, I guess. <laughs> stepped into a right. chair doesn't sound like a good idea. Uh, and Dave, you were obviously one of the one of the guests in that conversation. But for for those who may not have downloaded that episode, um, I'd love for you to kind of share your story a little bit. Um, you know how you got to where you are, the vision behind Mongoose, um, and everything in between. Okay, Gil. Um, sure. So um, I was I was introduced uh, to higher ed and the challenges that higher ed had when I was a student at the University of Dayton. Um, and this is 1996 uh, around there, just to give you a very clear date as to my age. Um, and um, nobody's counting. <laughs> yeah, sure. So um, that was when the internet was. Well, the, the internet was not new, but the web was was new. And we, my roommate and I, you know, joked about you know the UD's website was like text based, and boy, schools should probably do a better job of presenting who they are, you know? And so we ended up um, pitching the head of PR at UD and um, she was kind enough to introduce us to um, all other leaders at the institution. And um, that's when I was introduced to the VP for enrollment. Uh, and his name was Chris Munoz. And he was, Chris and I spoke most weekdays for the next six years. Um, he was a mentor of mine and introduced me to enrollment management and enrollment marketing. And um, we, um, my roommate and I built an admission site uh, for UD and students were able to personalize the website. <clears throat> and when they did that, um, we were able to uh, update their CRM, which was Emis, which is a, a no Levitz product be, before the R came in, came in there. It was a <laughs> box pro system. And, and so that, that was pretty progressive for 1990, I guess, 97 now. Um, and so we built one of the first, uh, online applications, uh, for, for schools and, um, UD got a ton of press and they were in the New York Times, they were in the Washington Post, they were in the Chronicle, that you could apply to college on the, on the World Wide Web. And so that, so that kind of um, exposure, we were very fortunate to get that. And so I started my uh, first ed tech software company and uh, ended up working uh, with a few hundred schools and we help them uh, build their websites, build the integrations to their CRMs and their ERPs, um, and help them really communicate better with prospective students, parents, current students, um, and alumni. So I was hooked, and I've spent the rest of my career um, helping students and higher ed uh, have a better relationship. Wow, that's it. It's interesting because it's fun how, you know, 1996, I, I like to believe that you know, I'm a huge Colorado Rockies fan because I grew up in Colorado and they started in 1993. And in my mind, 1993 is perpetually 15 years ago. It doesn't matter how many, <laughs> years, it's perpetually 15 years. So we'll say in the 15 years ago realm, a lot has changed, but a lot has stayed the same, right? There's still institutions struggling with making sure that their website is better supporting prospective students. Sure, there might be more images on it. It's less text-based and more image-based, but we still struggle with content. But, you know, there's 
still you know a desire for better integrations between places where students are engaging and the CRM, right? And so it, it, in, in a lot of ways, you are on the forefront of these things and there's there's still a lot that needs to be done. And it feels like it's never, it's never, it's never ending, right? There's always ways that we can be better and do better. Um, I, I know that, you know, one of the things we spoke about on the, the original podcast, the AI and academia episode, and for our listeners, we'll put a link to that past episode in our episode notes. Uh, but you know, you had, um, I think we, you, we we had that conversation in the height of the AI hysteria, where it seemed like every other day there was a new pundit with a new prediction about how AI was going to change everything, and it was going to you know people were concerned about losing their jobs, and there was concern that still you know permeates to some extent. But mm-hmm. uh, I do remember that you know one of your main predictions was that things aren't going to change overnight, right? It's not like uh, because, and I think maybe it comes a little bit from that experience of having been in this space, especially in the ed tech side of higher education for so long, you know, you and I both know that change is more incremental than, than anything else. And it might move a little more rapidly, but it's not like everyone in admissions has lost their jobs because the robots came in and started processing all the applications. Right. Um, So now that we're, now that we're six, nine months into this conversation, which seems like a decade ago at this point, um, what are your thoughts on kind of the way things are going right now and the conversations that you're having with the team at Mongoose for how AI is impacting your work, but also how it's impacting the work of college and university partners? So I think that the atmosphere is much calmer now. You know, we've, we've, we've been able to, um, to some extent come to, you know, Piece with oh, there's the, there's these exciting new new tools that we can use. Let's be thoughtful about how we can use them. Um, and the you know the term AI is just so so broad. Um, we could say we've been doing AI for twenty years now. You could say AI didn't really come out until Ch- Chat GPT showed the world that it was here. Mm-hmm. Um, the answer is in between there. Um, and, and so I can tell you that, um, the conversations that, that we've been having with our partner institutions, um, what's been appealing to them has been this concept of having a chatbot that could, that is trained. So, um, on being an expert on their institution and being an expert on the nuances of financial aid and being an expert Mm -hmm. on knowing what um, transfer students are dealing with compared to adult and online compared to undergrad, right? And um, that's that's pretty incredible that that you could have such a helpful artificial intelligence piece of technology communicate to your audiences in an extremely accurate and compelling way and oh by the way whatever language the student starts to type in the the bot can talk to them back in that language fluently which is just incredible and and i'm and and i'm not saying this is not a flex or a brag from mongoose this 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 is a commodity now i mean you know um, mm-hmm. that it's so accessible and that's why it's so exciting that you don't need data scientists and a whole team of people to do this. You need to be thoughtful about, about how you do it and the impact of um, how much it could help reduce the friction of students and parents learning about institutions and students' experiences while they're there. You're, you, you no longer have to be dependent on if there's staff available to talk, if there's staff turnover, that's a problem. Um, and, and higher ed for for years has had beautiful missions. <laughs> they they want to um, make education accessible to everybody, and that is such a beautiful um, goal. And AI and technology it is the most um gosh transformational game changing um disruptive if you mm-hmm. will technology to help towards that end which is such a beautiful end um 
maybe more than the internet it, it itself. And I, and I, I want to back up these bold statements because I, because I have seen them to be true and I know they're true. Yeah. And let's talk about that a little bit. I want to roll it back to the, per, the perception with higher ed. It's, it's interesting. Cause you know, I know, I, I don't know about you, but I always hear from people that we don't have enough time in our day. We're always, ch- we have, we don't have enough resources. We, we need help to, to get everything done. And then all of a sudden, you know, nine months ago we have this, com- there's these, this, re- this, this resource rather that will, that comes along that could presumably help with a lot of that, right? Like you said, a, a chat bot that's online 24, seven, 365, and is able to handle the redundant questions that an admissions counselor might normally get, right? Let's use that as an example. That's not replacing an admissions counselor, right? That's making it so that the admissions counselor, one, may be retained at a higher rate because they're not getting burned out by having to deal with answering the same questions over and over again. But two, it makes them more readily available to better support students who are in their face on campus, greet parents and families and be, you know, we, we, we talk about, you know, how, you know, during COVID, the, the, the challenge that a lot of admissions officers had was we hired these people to be people people. And now, you know, because of everything that's going on in the world, they're stuck in their house doing information sessions and meeting with families on Zoom, which nobody liked, but they did out of, out of a necessity. So now what, what technology can enable, I'm going to, I'm going to throw this thought process at you and let me know how off base or on base I am. If the technology can enable you to free up your time to do the work that a human can do that a robot can't, why not let the robot be a part of your team, right? And allow, and find ways to identify efficiencies. And a big part of that would be the accessibility of your, of, of answers to the most frequently asked questions. Is that far-fetched? Is that a crazy idea? Or is that kind of primary numero uno, what people should be thinking about? Preserving staff time for what humans do best is the name of the game, right? It is, staff burnout is real. Um, humans, humans, we need things like um, connection and food and sleep <laughs> and all of these things that, that we actually need that, that make us so effective when communicating with, uh, with other humans. Um, and I haven't met a client yet or a prospective client yet that had staff that felt this wasn't a wonderful thing. <laughs> and it, it is, and it's because they can preserve their time having genuine conversations and having empathy um, while the technology can just make that ultra efficient. And that is a game changer. That means less turnover. That means better conversations. That means more empathy. Um, and, and, and that's a pretty, pretty significant thing to get excited about. Yeah. And I think that that's a, that's a great point. And it, it brings about the humanization of the process that I think you know, prior to chat GPT, automation was kind of removing from the process, right? Dear first name is emails and Mm -hmm. out letters. And and that's our, our, you know, we can check the box that, okay, we've got a communication plan because we're, we've got emails and letters that are going out. And now this kind of creates an opportunity to kind of, you know, by leveraging technology, allow the human to get back involved in the process a little bit more, right. And, and be there for students in the process. Um, So, we're going to take a, a quick break, and when we come back, we're going to dive a little bit deeper into that point about uh, about empathy and the human connection, because I think that that's something that um, a lot of people may forget about just in the hustle and bustle of the, the 24-hour news cycle around AI and chat GPT and, and all of these you know, new technology and resources. It's not just about the technology. It's about the, the human connection, right? So we will take a pause, and we will be right back. Grow your student community, help them stay, and encourage giving with Cadence, Higher Ed's premier engagement platform from Mongoose. Designed exclusively for higher ed by higher ed professionals, Cadence helps you engage your audiences with the perfect balance of AI and personal connection. Talk to students, parents, and alumni on their time and how they want. Empower your staff with integrated text and chat inboxes that gather all conversations in one place. 
reach out to learn more about how our best-in-class service, support, and integrations have helped colleges and universities like yours have smarter conversations. From text to chat, make every message count. All right, we are back on FYI, the four-year institution podcast presented by Mongoose. And we are being joined today by Dave Marshall, who is the founder and CEO of Mongoose. Uh, just as a quick recap of our of our past segment, you know, when I first sat in the host chair of FYI, one of the first episodes we we did was called AI in Academia, and it was uh, has still to this date one of the most downloaded episodes of our podcast. Uh, and I think a big part of that was, you know, at the time that of that release, that was the height of the hysteria around AI and how it was going to take everybody's jobs and make everybody, you know, think rethink the way everything works. And you know, Dave had um, um, some really great predictions back then about the uh, the rate in which change will be uh, impacting higher education. But towards the la the end of the last segment, uh, we really touched on a on, on something that I think is oftentimes forgotten um, in the conversation when it comes to technology as a whole, not just AI, but just CRM platforms and websites and everything else. And that has to do with the, the human element, the human connection that, that people strive for. And I had, uh, you know, a, a number of weeks ago, we had uh, Paul LeBlanc, who is the president of Southern New Hampshire University, or was at the time, by the time this episode drops, he will have probably retired and now gone on to his next thing. Um, however, I, you know, in, in that conversation, he talked about the, the the impact of really that human connection, and even for you know the one of the largest online education providers in the country, the people who come to campus um, are looking for a truly you know human connection. And um, during you know the height of the COVID nineteen pandemic, we had you know challenges with making those connections, and we're getting back into that. But now at the same time, we have this new technology that's meant to that that can presumably um, you know facilitate a lot of these connections, right? And so, Dave, I it's a long way to get to um, you know, what we're what you were mentioning before around, you know, that that yearning for the human connection. And I know this is a topic that you're very passionate about um in, in a world that is filled with technology that some people think are replacing those human connections. I would argue that the the way we should look at it is technology should help to facilitate those connections and to make them make them more meaningful. And we've got to find ways to do that, right? And so I'd love your reaction to that that commentary and what the way you feel institutions might rethink the place technology as a whole can play uh, with facilitating those types of connections. Gil, I, there's some irony that technology can allow us to be even more human. Um, and if, if, if we think about um, re relationships that any of our listeners have, you, you're in a text conversation with a friend or family member, that's personal. You, you might even say things that you would never say, or you wouldn't, you might have a little anxiety if you were right in front of them. And, and that it, it just facilitates such a beautiful safe environment to have vulnerable conversations to have in important conversations um and when it comes to students feeling that sense of belonging right and having having someone that that they can speak to that that they feel is an advocate for for them or they know that that that, that they could reach out um I have a story for you. So one of our clients is, is a, a large um, uh, four-year public research institution, and they use our uh, product for orientation as one of the teams. And they hired a student worker to uh, have text conversations with um, all of the pers all of the per prospective students, and then accepted students, and then enrolled students, and then they they came to orientation. And this is a pretty large large group, and they came to orientation on campus. And um, our client wanted to introduce the student that that had been communicating with 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 all of these students and and families for months now and i forget his name let's say it's tom and so tom comes up and everybody stood up and cheered 
because they had built a connection with this student worker that they had questions in a vulnerable part of their life right now. Like this is a big decision and am I going to have friends? Am I going to be accepted? And this student was probably a wonderful communicator too, right? Um, and it, it, it just shows how, sure, they were using a software application or the student was. The students themselves were just, texting you know um and it allowed that that institution and that student worker let's call him tom to have empathy at at scale which is just an incredible opportunity when we're when we're dealing with a time where the lack of connection um and and the and the and the nature of of higher ed and how um complicated that it can be for students um, having a lifeline that you're able to have genuine conversations with uh, is just an incredible opportunity. Yeah, and I, I wanna go back to what you mentioned before, cause I know I've, I've heard you speak on this topic and I think it's worth a, a revisit for our listeners is uh, the, the difference between fitting in and belonging, right? I think that there's a uh, important distinction there that, you know, so many people, you know, kind of think, oh, well, you know, we, we create an environment where you can fit in. It's like, well, f- there's a difference between that. And I'd love for you to kind of sh- to dive in to what that distinction is for folks. And then if we're so bold, how some of the, the use of technology might be able to enable students to to feel that way. And I know you touched a little bit on it with um, how, you know, you can break down barriers of communication and how people feel um, and, and saying things that you might not normally be feel comfortable saying, but I'll, I'll defer to you on, you know, the commentary around that, that difference between uh, fitting in and belonging and how technology might enable students to accomplish that sense of belonging. I think fitting in is often like top of the funnel. You know, you see pictures of students uh, that might look like you. You're reading about student spotlights that might look like you. There's programs, you know, so you you hypothesize that. Yeah, I think I think I might fit fit here. Um, and that in, in in of itself is a really key step because we want to make sure everyone thinks that they would fit in. Right. We want to, you know, not just um, have a subset of the population think that they would fit in because then you're ignoring a whole other group. So or groups. But once you get past that step, um, belonging is a whole nother energy. It's it's a whole nother. It's no longer um, a guess. (laughs) You feel it and you feel it viscerally. And um, you can't fake that, you know, that's, that's, that's the outcome of connection, you know, and, and so the, the, the more that you're able to do that at, at scale, um, the better it's going to be for the student, the better it's going to be for the institution and ultimately society that you're going to have more students that gain access to ed- to education that are able to successfully navigate the challenges and have more of a chance to be successful after um and so when i when i think about um like a really good use case would would be if um a one of our clients is having a either text or chat conversation with a student. And um, you, you t- spoke about like personalization used to be high first name, right? And yep. now with technology and with AI, a human could be having a conversation with a human and they might, and when the staff member was about to respond, the technology can then say, Hey, you know, you're responding in a way that, um you you might have missed this is actually a transfer student and you might you might have missed that they were previously having challenges like this so you might want to address that um and oh wow that's that, that's a really good point and and so um 
then you're not talking at somebody you're talking to them and with mm-hmm. them and and you know that you're that there's a perceived level of caring let's hope it's real right most staff in higher ed genuinely care <laughs> so um and 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 that's just it, an incredible use of technology to build trust to build connection um, that wasn't possible with a plasma was really, really hard to build a year ago. And, and now we can just do that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I I think point one, I've got to make t-shirts now that say belonging is the outcome of connection. Cause I think that's an amazing quote. Um, Part two is that the last point you just made is the, is the antithesis of technology isn't going to replace the admissions counselor, all it's going to do is enhance their ability to better serve students, right? That example you just gave of making suggestions, it's like, it's like typing in Grammarly and them saying, Hey, you, you, this is, this doesn't really make a lot of sense. Reword this, right? It's the same concept, but tied to that individual interaction with that individual student to make sure that we are truly tailoring our response. The bot isn't necessarily sending that response. It's helping you make your response better because it's, deeper in the funnel than what the bot would pro- would be enabled to, to really support. Uh, but it's it's going to help you to, to be more thoughtful and help you to make a better connection, thus leading to that student having a better sense of belonging. Um, so that's great. So I think, I think what we'll do is we'll pause for one more break. And then when we come back, I want to pick your brain on, all right, when we get back together in six months or nine months, what's the narrative going to be then, right? And I think, you know, we had a pretty good batting average on the past one when we had that conversation. <laughs> so no pressure, but uh, Mr. 3000 will be coming up to the bl- the plate next uh, oh, to great. share predictions for the next six to 12 months um, for how AI is going to continue to evolve and become more and more integrated into the work that we do. And so we'll take a break. We'll be right back. Thoughtfully nurture applicants, personalize retention efforts, and exceed fundraising goals with our Cadence Engagement Platform's text messaging solutions. Designed exclusively for higher ed by higher ed professionals, Cadence helps you engage your audiences with the perfect balance of AI and personal connection. We leverage an intuitively designed interface and easy to use texting templates so you can have targeted conversations or scale up to expand your reach. Our powerful smart messaging can respond automatically, exactly how you would. And to measure progress, track your campaigns with unparalleled reports and analytics. Effectively meet your community where they are as we proudly feature an industry leading 95% read rate within three minutes. It's never been easier to make every message count. All right, welcome back to FYI, the Four Year Institution podcast presented by Mongoose. I'm your host, Gil Rogers. And for this last segment, we have Dave Marshall, founder and CEO of Mongoose, um, who's got some predictions for us. Um, so we've spent a good amount of time today um, talking about how AI and you know technology in general enables us to build better connections uh, and build a sense of belonging for students who are coming to our campuses uh, or who are currently enrolled at our campuses. Uh, and so before the break, I asked Dave, you know, when we get back together in six to 12 months, what is the, you know, what's, what's the narrative going to look like? What's, what are the gonna, recommendations going to be? Where are we going to be when it comes to the interactions that AI is being a part of or facilitating and how is technology continuing to, to craft and, and support the way that we're supporting students um, at our institutions? So Dave, I will turn the mic to you. Okay. So I think we're, we're you know, we can kind of see the direction that a lot of software applications, whether you use Outlook or Gmail, um, in your CRM, there's 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 some standard things that you're seeing, like use AI to summarize a conversation. Uh, you use AI to uh, recommend a response. Um, so those are generative AI opportunities to make us better better communicators to make us understand faster 
and things like that. So that's that that's already kind of you know that, that that's not super bold because like we're seeing that now, right? Um, and and I and I think that we're going to continue to see more and more of that. Um, what I predict, and I I heard a great quote uh, a month ago: "If you want to know the future, create it." I love that. It's just a very empowering quote. And um, I predict that um, we're going to be able to, you're going to see colleges be able to look at a mass set of conversations that are done by text, done by chat, done on the phone, done by email. And this is outside of just mongoose here. This is that we're able to look at conversations and AI and the model that, that we train to be a helpful tool is going to be able to say, okay, here's what's happening with all of your various cohorts. This cohort's feeling this emotion and this cohort's feeling that one. And the reason that they're feeling it is, is, is because of this. So imagine if, if you're able to, uh, colleges are going to be able to, um, and, some are now, um, it, it be able to detect the emotions of prospective and current students and be able to extract the topics that are related there. We all know high, higher ed is riddled with like misperceptions <laughs> and, and that causes frustration and that causes anxiety and that causes confusion. Um, mm -hmm. And to get that insight, into when those e emotions are arising and and why and oh by the way so that's like the discovery of what's happening you can be able to look in and say oh that's what's happening oh by the way there's very high touch tools that you can just reach out to them or automate it like we see that you might have been frustrated regarding this i'm here to help can i help you with this a b c and d that was not even a dream a year ago that, mm. um, and now it's just very accessible, very pragmatic. And that's what you're going to see. Yeah. I think in a world where, again, automation has kind of killed personalization in a lot of ways, right? We, we know when we've had this conversation on this podcast with many guests numerous times that, you know, personalization is, is really about changing the interaction based on what that student's needs or emotions or challenges that they're facing not that their name is Chuck and that they are interested in the marine biology program, right? Like that's the, that's table stakes that you put their first name in the email and you know what they're interested in. Right. Um, and so I think that, that, you know, if we think about traditional communication flows, right. Traditional communication flow is we send an email. Do they open it? Do they not open it? If they did, we do this. If they didn't, we do this. Right. And if they click the link in the email, we do that. And so I think there's a certain element of, what what kind of what kind of automation can we have to make recommendations for people to reach out when they reply with a certain tone or they reply with a certain challenge or they reply you know negatively or affirmatively and i think that's a great opportunity that we haven't even really started diving deeply into at at scale for i'm sure there are institutions that are thinking that way and they're working on it but there's an opportunity for more to, to do that. And, and that's where we get to the point where we, we move away from the mass marketing approach that everybody does, which then floods every student's inbox with a hundred emails from schools that they aren't interested in talking to, to an environment where they're engaging with, stu with institutions in a way that is actually adding value to the conversation and building better connections which leads to them feeling that sense of belonging with the institutions that do it right. Right. And if you're, and you know, you can, if you apply this effort to student, to, to your entire approach, now you've got an, a great opportunity to stand out and not be the, the same, the lookalike school to every other school that's sending the same message to every student, because that's what the comm flow was built to do. Um, so I love that. And I think that that's a great opportunity for institutions to think differently when it comes to how AI is going to, again, facilitate those types of connections. You know, Gilly, that's right. And, and I think that um, you're going to see schools use communication strategies that encourage more open-ended responses. How, how are you feeling? 
Um, in yep. the past, it's been easy to kind of shy away from that just because it's almost Im- impossible to manage at scale. Like, oh my gosh, now we have all these students that are telling me that they that they have these needs and I can't keep keep up with it. And what do they do? But 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 now that we can provide empathy at scale and understanding at scale, um, that's a great step. And yep. there, now now is a great like right after that is a great opportunity for automation. So like um, they're frustrated because they can't get their transcript, right? And you're able to identify that. You see what they want to do. How about I automate that for you? What's your first name? What's your last name? What's your student ID? Do you want it now? Do you want it at the end of the semester? Do you want it? Or you you need you need to pay you need to pay your bill. I can help you with that right right here. Yeah. Um, so so that automation that call it cold. I don't know. Call it useful. Tra- tra- transactional piece comes after after you've um validated like this is how you're feeling and i'm able to see it and this is why now i can help you efficiently get get that done yeah yeah and i think that's a i mean again go back to the beginning of the conversation where it's it's not replacing the job of the admissions officer or the financial aid officer or the orientation leader all it's doing is making them more available for facilitating human connections and i don't think any institution in the country is saying yeah we've got nothing but time just go ahead and like let us just work with every student right like they they we need to identify ways and you know we've spent a lot of time talking about the impact on the student and the connect cuz they they should be at the forefront of every conversation but maybe we'll reserve some time for for next time to also talk about the benefits and you know mental health benefits and the efficiency benefits and everything for the staff at the institutions because I, oh, I yes. I'm going to put my I'm going to put my prediction out there twelve months from now there's still going to be challenges or nine months from now there's still going to be challenges with managing their time and turnover and making sure that the people who are you know they're we're, we're talking about mission driven people who are there because they've truly feel like they're they're helping students and they want to help students and they are helping students if we can help them to be more efficient and effective with their time they can do that without the expense of their mental health right and so um i think that's another that'll be our follow-on conversation maybe we'll do that one in three months and then we'll we'll, that'll be our bridge uh Uh, i I would love to have that conversation and i would love to share some insights that we're seeing and it's all happening in real time you know and uh, what 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 an exciting time to be alive and to see this classic like almost not changing kind of friction of, of access to education and and um, struggles through the process and how to be successful and all of these super caring empathetic staff members that want to help and they're frustrated because they can't and they're overwhelmed and the students have misperceptions and they're frustrated. And now we're at a time where we can actually see um, significant improvement there. I'm, I'm excited to talk to you in three months and in 12 months, boy, it'll be fun to look back and then try to look forward then too. Yep, absolutely. Well, consider it done. Word to the wise to our listening and viewing audience. I have access to Dave's calendar, so I can. I'll, I'm going to grab this time, and we're going to. This do is it. a truth. This is a truth, and I've had to reschedule this twice. And I feel like such a jerk. So Gil's gotten really good at access to my calendar. There we go. So I'll make it happen. Well, <laughs> thank you, Dave, for making the time, and we are looking forward to continuing this dialogue on a regular basis. For our listeners, all of the resources and information that we've mentioned will be in the episode notes, and we will see you next time on FYI. Thanks, Gil. Bye.